Okay, so I hope everybody can see my screen. Uh, got it. As you hopefully know, know, this is a conceptual workshop, so we are not building anything. Uh, and uh, I start with with. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, so who am I? I'm, I'm born in Vienna as a digital native. I'm an open source evangelist and I try to be a change maker for the 21st century. Uh, there is a lot of content uh, in, in my keynote, so please uh, fasten your seat belts. So that's uh, our agenda in the first uh, 30 minutes. Uh, I make a presentation and then uh, in the main part, we will have uh, hopefully a vivid discussion. Uh, as I said before, uh, all the links and all the information you can find on the mirror board and the link to it is in, in the chat channel. So as an open source evangelist, uh, I initiated a, a meetup group so, uh, in, in Austria, in Vienna, about uh, one year ago. And uh, in Austria, we have some uh, really flagship projects. Uh, and uh, be, because uh, my opinion is that uh, open source hardware is not only electronics. And we have four projects which are very interesting in Austria. The first project is uh, a, a high quality uh, video camera which is uh, sponsored by the European Commission. And it's a modular system and uh, it's running Linux on it. The second project uh, you can see is the social vehicle, the SOV, which is a electromobility project. The third project is an architecture pro project it's called uh, Vivi House, and uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, uh, you can create buildings with uh, a, a big do-it-yourself uh, part. And the fourth project is the Centennial Wash Machine, uh, which uh, wants to to build a wash machine, washing machine, how it worked. Uh, in, in, in old times, uh, so it's uh, very sustainable and of course it's repairable and all the plans, uh, the plans and uh, drawings are open under open source. So that, that brings me to open source hardware and uh, we have a historical moment because uh, two weeks ago uh, Open source hardware uh, is under a Dean spec that uh, like you, you can think on, on it about uh, like a preliminary stage of a standard. And uh, on this point, I would like to hand over to Xavier to, to, to talk a, a bit uh, about this Dean spec project. Hi, can you hear me? Is this sound okay? Yes. Great. Uh, well, thanks for the uh, invitation and the introduction. Um, so before all, um, so everything I will say now is uh, um, I've written that in the in, in the chat, so you can just follow it uh, while I'm saying it. 
So I'll start to say a few words about me. So I'm assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Bath in England. And I do research in sustainable product development and citizen participation in product development. But more important for now, I'm part of the working group who is due to this um, BIM Spec 3105, and the standard we will talk about now, together with the German standardization organization, which is called DIN, which stands for Deutsches Institut für Normung. So this DINSPEC 3105 initiative in short, what is that? It's a standard delivering an explicit definition of the term open source hardware based on objective and enforceable criteria. This means that basically it gives, delivers a reference to make the difference between what is open source hardware and what is not. And why do we need that? Um, some of you may already know the open source hardware definition 1.0 hosted by the Open Source Hardware Association. And if not, this is a generally accepted definition in the field of open source hardware. The problem with that definition is that it is quite vague. Um, it tells you exactly under which terms you should share the hardware documentation so you can call it open source hardware, but doesn't tell you what you should pull into, into the documentation. And so to put it, to put it a bit um, bluntly, um, you can be compliant with this definition by sharing pretty much nothing, but as long as you choose the right license, uh, you can still call it open source. So there is a bit of um, uh, connective dissonance here. So how this new standard DINSPEC 3105 addresses this uh, in two ways. Um, so this, the standard has two parts. The part one uh, is called open source hardware requirements for documentation, and it extends the open source hardware uh, association definition. Um, so we now have an explicit, explicit reference of what is the minimal set of information you need to share and under which term you should share this information so you can call a piece of hardware open source hardware. Um, and the second part of that, the second part uh, called open source hardware community-based assessment, um, defines requirement for community-based certification procedure. The idea here is to build a certification process that copies the peer review process used in scientific publishing so that certifications are not granted by a central closed en entity but more given by uh, the community, open source hardware community itself. Um, so this is as far as I know, quite unique model in the field of product certification procedures, but um, in my opinion, that's a model which is very valuable because it fits well with the ethos of, um, of the open source hardware communities. Um, I could say, a bit more about a bit more details about the content, but I, but the time is really limited. So, um, um, for now, I would just say a few words about the story behind this um, uh, Dean Spec 3105 and how it came to life. So the project started in March 2019, with more than 20 people involved in the working group and more than 50 people in the mailing list. We had uh, 35 more than 30, 25 institutions represented, um, mostly from the EU, from the US, and also from Latin America. And among uh, these institutions, we had also the Open Source Hardware Association to make sure that we don't make any uh, duplicate or we don't uh, conflict with the ex existing definition. The version one has been published in very lately, uh, uh, recently, sorry, on the 20th, 26th of June. Um, the official version is, um, well, this standard is open source, uh, so it's uh, available free of charge in the um, web shop of the Boeth edition. Uh, I put a link in the, um, in, in the pad so you can access it. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, um, the link in the Boeth edition web shop requires you a registration, so I also put the link with a uh, link to the um, uh, the community version of this document, which is available in the working groups GitLab repository. Um, yeah. um, so this, this standard is now published. Uh, we are now working as, as next steps after this publication of the V1.0, we are working uh, on a first wave of certifications 
And for that, we are currently looking for voluntary project and reviewers. Um, so the idea is to test the standard that just came out in practice and to identify any necessary amendments that will need to be made shortly. Um, this process is now um, facilitated by an organization which is called Open Source Ecology Germany. So they are setting up the necessary IT infrastructure. So in terms of project, project archive, uh, submission portal, discussion platform, etc., and this should be online in fall 2020. Um, so as I said, uh, we are currently looking for people volunteer, voluntary project uh, to test this standard. So uh, if you have an open source hardware project and you would like to be interested in supporting uh, this project by testing the certification process contact us um, um, and in turn, um, uh, if you'd like to support this project as well, but by being on the other side, so by, by being a reviewer of these uh, uh, applications, uh, here as well, we are looking for reviewers. So any profiles are welcome, just uh, contact us. I'll put as well a, a contact, an email address in, um, in the tab. Um, yeah, the icing on the cake in this project is that uh, the nice thing or this, this, this new standard is, is the first ever open source project, open source standard published by a national standardization institute. So it's quite an achievement. Um, this project with Dean was a pilot project for them uh, to develop a new kind of a standardization process as part of their portfolio. So we're not only helping, well, we are not only um, making advances in open source hardware, but as well in standardization processes in general, and it's quite my thing. Um, and so as a result, uh, if there is ever a second version of the DINSPEC 3105, then it will be the result of an open standardization process where anybody can participate. And this is not the way generally standardization process works. Um, uh, those processes are generally more, um, well, they are collaborative, but not completely open in the sense of open source hardware. The other icing on the cake is that um, through these projects, we were able to acquire quite big German um, organizations that are increasingly interested in the topic of open source hardware and are willing to promote it. And so Dean is one of them, but also the BBI, the Association for German Engineers, which is pretty, a pretty big thing in Germany, as, as well the, the German Ministry of Economy. So uh, just by having the standard, it makes it visible for really established institutions and just help to, to put open source hardware on the policy making table, right? Um, yeah, next step of that, uh, uh, on this project, and I will stop with that. Um, we are currently in discussions with the ISO, the International Standardization Organization, to make it an ISO standard out of it. Um, so to report it from, from the national level to the international level. Um, and we are also working in an extension on the part three of this in spec uh, that will integrate another standard um, uh, that Emilio and Andrew, I think they are here in the chat today. They can they can also say a few words about that. Um, yeah. And that's it. Um, I think I, I, I've covered quite a lot of things in a short time already, maybe a bit overwhelming. I'm really happy to answer any question or to, uh, to go into discussion round now or later. Yeah, uh, Jeremy, will you be around later on? Uh, we were planning to have discussions after the presentations. Will you yeah. still be around? You will? Yeah. Okay, because I, I have one question for you, so I want to make sure that I'm given the opportunity okay, cool. to ask it. Cool. All right, thanks. Okay, Leopold, let's get back to you. Huh? Yes, okay, so I'd like to continue with my keynote, but I have a problem because Franz is the host now and I don't, it's not allowed to the screen sharing. Franz? One second, <laughs> of course. Um. Um, hi, I am uh, Anastasia, I'm here. So any technical problems, I can help you. Yes, uh, yes. 
problem is I think uh, the recording has stopped. No, it's, it hasn't, Leopold. I see recording is still going. Oh, okay, so that's So, that. so okay. you don't need to worry. I will take care of these things. And if there is a problem, I will inform you. You just that's, that's need to be relaxed for your presentation. Uh, so don't worry about the background things that are happening. I also have many questions about the open source hardware for later on. And, um, and as a co-host, you should be able to uh, share your screen. So if you try to press the share screen button, let's see if it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Yes. We Perfect. See it. So you can uh, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Anastasia. So, uh, now I, I would like to continue with, with some activities from Open Land Lab. Uh, Open Land Lab uh, is uh, a fab lab uh, on the countryside about 150 kilometers south from Vienna. And uh, as you, uh, I think you know how the Silicon Valley started. And so we have a, or also some uh, some things we are starting in in our barn. One is the is an electro velo mobile, and the other one is a trimaran, which is a, a friend of mine building. And uh, if you zoom out, you can see. Uh, Although it's on the countryside, we are in the center of Europe. So that's uh, our, our fab lab part. I'm, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a navigation problem. Okay, now. So I've, I've made a, a vision board of the Open Land Lab where I want to go. And on the top side, you see uh, what's, what's called an rough ship. And uh, that, that's a pretty old concept, uh, and, uh, but it's a good inspiration. And in the center, you can see the grid house. It's a building which is in Brazil. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not an open source project, but what I like, it's very integrated into the nature. So I, I want to, to think about a building, a similar building, uh, but uh, want to put uh, everything under open source. And uh, I, I want to integrate with nature. So, uh, Maybe you know there is uh, the Wood Wide Web, uh, which is about uh, communication of, of plants, like trees are talking, uh, exchanging signals uh, uh, over the air and also un un under the, the ground. Excuse and me, Leopold, could you, yeah. uh, could you repeat the name of the house? Some people are asking in the chat. Okay, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, called Grid house, and uh, you find the, the link uh, on the mirror board. Mm -hmm. It's it's in in Brazil. So I am since I'm on the countryside, uh, I'm not so excited about uh, 3D printers and CNC machines and laser cutters. So I, I try to think about what we can do in a fab lab. Uh, on the countryside. And uh, maybe you know the FarmBot project. You can see here uh, that that's one project I, I like very much. And also I would like to think about uh, uh, bioreactors, about algae, and uh, about mushrooms and worm farms and all these kind of things. So here you can see the, the FarmBot project, which is an open source project. And uh, since I'm also thinking about vertical farming, 
uh, uh, I thought uh, it should be also possible to move it to the uh, vertical dimension. And then I found out that there is a, a, a similar project uh, from Pipeline Barcelona. It's called the Romi Robotics uh, for Micro Farms. And uh, they also get, they, they got a lot of farming. So that was the reason I stopped my project. But uh, maybe I, I started again. Uh, what uh, I also like very much on the FarmBot project is that uh, the idea is that there are a lot of FarmBots distributed and there is a, a, a data exchange between all these FarmBots. So we can learn uh, in, in a distributed way. Uh, another project uh, which I like very much is from the MIT. It's the Open Agriculture Initiative. And there are three projects now. The first one is the personal food computer you can see here. The second one is a bigger one. It's a food server. It's in a standard shipping container. And the third project is uh, called a tree computer. Where, where they try to simulate all the climate zones which exist around the world. And I've, I'm thinking to, to copy the food server and uh, work on it. So here you can see that's an art project, which is the, the earth computer and uh, radio mycelium. And I think it's very important that we work together with artists because they are thinking different. Uh, here you see the, the mentioned uh, wood white web. The, the link to it uh, you find also in the in the Myra board. Uh, here are some links to uh, projects which are thinking about biomaterials. And here I come to the idea to move, uh, to, to make a shift uh, from Fab Labs to Open Eco Labs. And there is one homepage in, in Germany. There are about eight uh, Open Eco Labs in Germany now. And there is a manifest you can read there. Unfortunately, it's only in German. And I tried to get in contact with them but didn't get any answer now. But I think it would be great uh, if uh, we uh, in increase this network and make it an international network. And I would like to discuss with all of you and the community what you think to, to, uh, about the next generation of Fab Labs. Okay, now there is a small part about uh, what I call physical dimensions, uh, because uh, uh, we, we, we always are talking about space. And I, I think it's not only a question for my fab lab, or, or of our fab labs, it's also a generic question. So in, in, in my case, the, the Fab Lab, I have about 2,000 square meters uh, as, as a playground where I can, uh, for instance, I, I could make a, a building there with tubes and make a hotel and uh, maybe hundreds of, of uh, tubes uh, and uh, for, for Airbnb and make the, the, the biggest profit with this space. On the other hand, I could uh, let it uh, like it is now. You, you see it's very untouched. The only thing we, we, we have made since years is a greenhouse pyramid, which is working really great. So that's, that's a question. Uh, how do we deal with this, uh, with the available space in a balance? 
The second uh, question, big question is how, we, how do we deal with, with energy? And uh, of course now it's obvious that we use uh, solar energy and maybe we use uh, uh, power banks and batteries to, 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 to store the, the solar energy. But uh, I, I'm sure that we need a hybrid system because uh, we, we, we cannot uh, work only with, with solar energy alone. So the next question, big question is uh, how do we deal with time? And I, I'm thinking since some years now, which uh, trees I want to plant. And this question goes beyond my lifetime in the decision. So it's, it's a very hard uh, uh, the decision. And also, you know, the climate change is uh, the, the, the climate change. So it's, it's not so easy to make a decision which the trees to plant and uh, how many trees and which distance and so on. So the next uh, uh, material question is about soil. Here you see a diagram what's, uh, what's uh, all in one square meter of, of soil. And uh, you might know that uh, only the top 10 centimeters are the humus layer. And uh, we have destroyed a lot of this humus layer with industrial agriculture. And it takes uh, 100 or 200 years to regenerate it by nature. So that's really a, a very big problem. Uh, and uh, the, the next point is uh, about water. You know, uh, there is a lot of drying now and uh, uh, I'm thinking how I can harvest uh, water on, on my space. And all these questions are questions I think, uh, I, I hope that there are many people in the community which have answers to these questions. So, and the last part is about uh, information. And uh, Michael Bauwens, uh, he is the founder of the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation. Uh, he, he, has, uh, he has done a lot of work about open knowledge and open everything. You find everything online and the links are also in the, uh, on the mirror board. So just in short again, uh, I, I think there are three main parts. We are talking about architecture, that's all the buildings we are creating. Then we have uh, culture or agriculture. And then maybe there is one remaining small part, which is really nature. Uh, it, it's, it's not really much now. And uh, I, I think that's a big question, how we, 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 we balance these three parts. And in the center of all this, uh, of course, is the health question, the health of, of, of uh, the human health and the nature health. And uh, this, this question strongly uh, belongs to our climate change. So uh, now I have uh, collected some theories. Uh, uh, I assume you are familiar with uh, permaculture and there uh, are some design principles. That's why I like it very much. There is the, perma, uh, the designer's manual for permaculture and as a software engineer and software architect, uh, I, I liked it very much. And uh, the, these design principles not only work for, for plants and for, for nature, you, you can generalize these this, this, this principles. So as I mentioned before, I'm also thinking about uh, vertical farming because it's said that we need to go to the third uh, dimension. And uh, what uh, 
vertical farmings are promising to solve is that they don't uh, they, they save about 90 percent of of water they are bringing the food production to the to the city uh, and so on and so on uh, what i that uh, in 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 principle there are um, three main systems the one is hydroponics which uh, is uh, using uh, a nutrition uh, solution and no soil. Uh, the second one is uh, aeroponics. Uh, it's uh, mainly for space uh, things and the, the NASA is, is working on it. The, the, it's, it, it, it takes the hydroponics to the extreme, I would say. And the third one, it's not really new, it goes back to the 60s. It's uh, aquaponics and uh, it's a, a circular system where you uh, have uh, uh, are growing fish and use the, the water from the fish for, for, for plants. The problem with it is uh, it's, it's a very complex system and you need uh, clean water and, and so on. So, I would like to, so the, here you can see some vertical farming systems as, as they exist. There are big systems in Singapore and, Ch and in Japan and so on. What I don't like on these systems is uh, they are closed systems and you can't go in it. You, as you can see on this picture, you, you have to, to, to uh, you, you need a suit. To, to don't destroy the system. And of course, yeah, it's, it's using LED light instead of sunlight. Uh, but uh, all these systems still uh, need a lot of energy. So that's, that's the reason I, I want to think about alternative systems. And uh, I call it vertical permaculture. Uh, uh, so I, I would like to think uh, maybe it's possible to use uh, hummus or, or other growing materials like sand and, 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 and substrates to, to uh, have, have a, a, a vertical permaculture system. I, I don't know if, if we can make a system by do it yourself. So may, maybe we can discuss this uh, later. Uh, I, I think it's very important that we discuss uh, uh, about our, our contributions to the sustainable development goals. And uh, as I said before, as, an, as a software architecture, architect, uh, I, I see that uh, design thinking is uh, very important because uh, in the meantime, I see that we have uh, a, a lot of design problems. And I think we, we need uh, new de design systems. To, we, we, we need uh, products which are the repairables and which are sustainable and so on. And we have to move to circular uh, economy. So we need a circular design. And uh, we, we need uh, modular systems. And uh, also we need uh, uh, to think about, uh, we, 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 we need to, to think uh, about a new kind of architecture. So here's uh, two diagrams about uh, circular economy and uh, cradle to cradle. And uh, at this point, uh, I want to move over to our big and large uh, visions. And I want to hand over to Franz Narada. OK. So uh, thank you, Leopold. Uh, yes. Uh, if you if you show the screen, if you continue showing the screen uh, that you just showed, or, or maybe I can do it. Uh, um, 
Okay, uh, I move back to screen sharing. Okay, so um, my name is Franz Nerada and uh, I am also trying to uh, make sense out of this uh, fantastic array of possibilities that we are facing. Uh, we, have, we are facing the potential for an enormous decentralization and we are facing the potential for a new uh, cooperation of man and nature, which goes far beyond uh, uh, traditional architecture, uh, agriculture, sorry. It goes far beyond that. It is including the whole range of production. Uh, yesterday I wrote, uh, I read uh, um, an article uh, about uh, the, the uh, idea to create uh, 500 fab labs around France, uh, one for each small uh, or medium city or even thousands. I don't know uh, how much they are, but uh, I think uh, decentralized production uh, with the sourcing of materials, as, as Leopold has shown that, with the sourcing of materials from the local natural, uh, with a new science of materials that can be uh, shaped by container factories what you, whatsoever, by, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, by the things that, that we are inventing right now which tend to be small, which tend to, which tend to fit into, into any given village or small town. Yeah? Uh, we will totally change the nature of economy. So uh, open ecolab is a, is a term with two sides. On one side, uh, it, it has this allusion to ecology. On the other side, uh, please stay with this picture because uh, okay. Uh, okay. Just, just tell me when you want to skip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other side, uh, it has this. It has also this uh, strong allusion to economy. Okay. I want to. I want to bring an example from uh, the a, a competition which took place uh, 25 years ago, which was one of the most visionary events I ever attended, which was. The question, how we, we, how we will live in the 21st century, there was a, a, a competition of major architect firms and the winning contribution was by Richard Rogers partnership from England. And they had, they had a scheme for uh, reordering, like in permaculture, for reordering our life. So they said, we can bring an urban core to each village. You know, this is, uh, this is a place outside Palma de Mallorca, the so-called Park Bit. Of course, this uh, is not the design which was realized, but I think it was the most intelligent and, and mind-boggling design, uh, which, which, will, uh, which, will, which has a value for our whole discussion. In fact, the three spheres of our existence, the urban, where we do our work, where we meet, the suburban, where we live, where we recreate ourselves, and the natural, where we go out, but also where we produce, uh, where we do agriculture. All this um, can be merged into a new form of human settlement. So I call this the global village. And it is very important to say that uh, permaculture, the permaculture design principles, they are valid, but mostly they are for the single farm. But probably we will not live in single farms, but we live in communal arrangements. The transition movement, for example, is built on permaculture, but it has redeveloped permaculture for small towns. But I think if we think it through, we need to we need to uh, we need to find a collective relation to to nature, and I think this is a very rewarding uh, uh, idea that nature can be much more important for our be for our life than ever before, and yet 
we will have at the same time, at the same moment, a sphere where we have everything that the city has to offer. Now, Leopold, please to the second slide. We, we want a city that allows miniaturization, proximity, organic functionality within a local network of life at large, uh, and we want to communicate with this nature around us better than ever before. To, to do that, we need more knowledge than the industrial society. That means what you have seen before, this urban core, we need to work like a global brain to make every single cell of this planet uh, in future work. Okay, this is, this is basically the idea that I want to throw in to give us a perspective that we have a long-term goal and what we are starting today and what we are developing out of the Fab Lab and out of the makers movement has one uh, important goal to turn the Anthropocene into a positive and not into a negative uh, <laughs> phase of the history of this planet. Next. So I want, I want to stress this. Uh, I have tried to dis dis describe a cell. I, 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 I want uh, uh, to, to, to stress the point that we're just beginning to understand that we will totally change the, the, the way we live in future because we have, uh, we have this tendency that we need to link things together organically. So uh, in fact, what we, are, what we are striving for is an external body, an external body of shapes that we cannot describe yet, but, uh, but probably this is an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work of artists, architects, engineers, and so on. Next. So um, once again, I think uh, this interdisciplinarity uh, is main, may, may be the main message of today's talk. And, and, and Leopold, with his enormous diving into all the developments, uh, I want just to simplify the message. And one thing that he also has said, the health of nature and the, and the human health is one health. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it's uh, all about uh, our future and it, uh, it raises a lot of uh, complex questions. And uh, there are some utopia and uh, I, I would, I, I'm very interested uh, about uh, what, uh, about your utopia in the, in the discussion. I, I just want to add uh, one uh, interesting project, uh, which uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's uh, all, it almost has started in, in Sweden. It's the region village project. And Netherlands, Almere near Amsterdam. But it is, uh, it is uh, starting simultaneously in various European countries. Okay, and uh, I just added to the visionary part that I think we have to, to, to think about new business models and about uh, new open source business models. And uh, on, on the link, uh, you, you find some very interesting stuff from Lars Zimmermann. Uh, yeah, have, have a look on it. So now I'm at the end of, of uh, my keynote. And uh, if there are any questions, so I, uh, I, I want to hand over to Mike. Uh, he, he makes uh, our moderation for the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Leopold and Franz. I think we have a relatively small group that 
it should be possible to go ahead and conduct the conversation directly via via voice if that we will try it out if it gets unwieldy then i'll come up with another solution i'd like to go ahead and start that process as i alluded to earlier jeremy i have a question for you this is tied to the open sourced hardware specifications and in the possibility of working with other organizations some sort of interface or in Interoperability. I don't know if you're, I'm assuming Jeremy, you're still there. Nope. Let's take a look. So I'm here. I'm here, but oh. I, uh, the, your voice was cut, and I was not a, able to. Not, listen. not, a, not a problem. I just wanted to make sure I was. I, I, I cut your attention. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, Open Repair Alliance? The Open Repair Alliance. No, it's not a word for me, but I... Okay, no worries. I can go ahead and briefly describe uh, what they're doing. They're coming up with their own standard for repair, and it's very, very interesting. I think you, you would enjoy it very much. One of the key components for me, what they're doing, is that they allow, via some sort of digital twin, that's how I understand it, to create... A, a protocol of what was done with the hardware. In other words, you can go ahead and follow the entire process of constructing the hardware, uh, whether there was any repairs to the hardware, who performed it, what actions were taken, kind of like a log file that you perform to the hardware. And I would think something like that would be a, a great addition to that of what you've put together, you and, and the others have put together. And I was just curious if you were doing anything along those lines, because eventually open hardware needs to be repaired. <laughs> yes. Um, so basically, the requirement, ideally, um, a, a piece of open source hardware, yes, uh, is something that can be made, uh, repaired, updated, and processed at the end of life. So I guess, um, um, if they uh, came up with a document or with a standard or with uh, uh, some requirements to make sure that products are repairable, or at least that um, you have enough information about the product to repair it, that's definitely something that uh, we should uh, have a look at. Yeah, yeah, so it's good. It could be a great addition. Yeah, for, for me, it goes lockstep with what you're doing because obviously that's the whole idea of open source that you can go ahead and repair it. And I, I think the interesting idea, as I mentioned, is that because the, the person who built it is not necessarily the person who repairs it. And so there's yeah. always the question of the research or the troubleshooting that needs to be performed. And so if you can speed the process up with a digital twin of the actual hardware so you can look at the log files or the history of the mm -hmm. of the hardware i think that would be quite insightful so working with a digital twin i mean um it's a really nice idea but it's quite heavyweight technology somehow uh uh for what i understand for a digital twin um i think in the sure. dean spec 3105 is we are trying to capture the minimal information that somebody needs to, to share. So it, it can be called open source hardware in the sense that uh, anybody can study it, can make it, uh, can sell it and uh, uh, yeah, verify it. Um, so I think the, 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 the emphasis in, in my answer is the minimal Set of set of information. I guess that having a digital twin will be like more than minimal. It will be the quite advanced uh, way of documenting the product or what happens through the product life cycle uh, or the life cycle of the actual product. Uh, it's definitely a great idea. I, d I don't know about this project, and I'll definitely recommend uh, the working group to have a look at it. 
in in my idea was not to cut cut you up off guard, Jeremy. That was, that was not my intention. Uh, yeah. But I would just I, I would just curious. Uh, get to your point about the digital twin. Um, I think it's one of those things that you can do, but you don't have to. It's not yeah. a re it's not a requirement, yeah. but. Uh, with regards to any type of standard, we want to have something that's doable. Everybody can do it. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you want to allow for a certain amount of scalability in that of what can be done. So one doesn't yeah. exclude the other, right? Yes. And, and one of the things that was uh, planned to do in this uh, the Inspector 105 project was to not only have the, the standard itself, but to have some kind of guideline uh, next to it. So the standards define the minimal requirements and the guideline says, well, actually you can do more, you can do that and that and that, and you can interpret the standard in that way and that way and that way. Um, it was, it was uh, more difficult than expected to do it, so we didn't mm -hmm. really end up uh, having this guideline, but this is definitely something that will be interesting for the V2. Mm -hmm. And, and I also think going back to the call to action that you had at the end of your presentation, that we have a number of individuals here on this live stream or webinar or whatever we call this, uh, that obviously have an interest in the subjects. So uh, I, I think it's very important if we together want to make something out of the standard, then we all need to do something. <laughs> that yes, means we all that's, get that's, involved. Um... I guess that's a challenge we have now. I mean, we, this working group and, uh, and the fact that I've um, uh, given some numbers about the number of people involved and uh, the representativeness in terms of global uh, uh, distribution of those people, uh, it was to tell that it's, just, it's not just a random group of people we try to um, acquire a lot of experts in open source hardware, people who have been involved in the field for a long time who are researching about it, who are doing it. Um, so we came out with this document, but it's still a document that is made by 20 people or 50 people, and it depends on how you count them. Uh, count them. Um, it will really be useful when we start using it. And for people to use it, we have to demonstrate that it works in actual practice. And, I, and that's, that's the challenge we have now to make this first batch of, let's say 50 certifications to run through the processes of this uh, community-based um, uh, certification process uh, to verify that the requirements are sensible, to refine the requirements, because actually what I didn't say is that um, one, difficulty of open source hardware is that hardware can say, well, can stand for pretty anything. I mean, it could be electronic hardware, it could be mechanical hardware, it could be mechatronic hardware, it could be whatever, textile or things I don't think of. And obviously, for each of these technologies, I will call them technologies, you cannot expect to have the same documents, right? Because um, like for, uh, for a piece of electronic hardware, it makes sense to have uh, schematics and PCB layouts, but these terms just make no sense in mechanical hardware. In mechanical hardware, you will need to have some kind of um, CAD drawing or manufacturing drawing or assembly instructions or whatever. Um, and even in the mechanical hardware, depending on the complexity of your product, of your product the, the documentation will look different. And this is the major issue we have with open source hardware documentation is that um, each technology or each category of project a product has their own requirement in terms of documentation. And so I guess the more the, the first innovation of this um, uh, standard is to state that or to acknowledge that each doc, each uh, technology requires different um, um, uh, type of documentation and for that we said actually in the standard itself it's written quite generically uh, gen uh, in a generic way what kind of documents are required but next to the to, to the standard there is a database of different technologies and what uh, technology what documents are required for those technologies and this is the living document 
but for now we 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 started with a really small database of really low key requirements and through making this first round of certifications then we'll learn about uh, by by looking at documentation we learn more about what are the things we can ask as a strong requirement or what are the things that are nice to have and then we will make this database of a techno we call them technology specific documentation requirements uh, we make this we will make this database evolve and then we will have a really functioning uh, whole, whole functioning set of uh, of requirements uh, that we can scale up um, once we can demonstrate there that it works and then we have a, a, a few projects uh, uh, sh proudly showing they are certified and then spreading the word and hopefully making some kind of snowball effect uh, making that this standards is getting used in reality yeah i agree and we've had a, a number of comments in the chat box to that of what we discussed and I'd like to kind of go through a few of them. One of them came from Franz and where he mentions open source hardware standard will lead to specifications. And I agree with that. Um, it, it's a question of, of practice uh, in, in trying things out and the knowledge that you're able to acquire by performing those actions. Yes. We had some others that, that uh, filled in the gaps to some of those things, Jeremy, Jeremy that I had mentioned, the links were supplied to that standard that I was referring to in the organization, yes. the Open Repair Alliance. So for anybody who's interested, that information is also to be found within the chat block box. So please feel free to go ahead and dig up that information there. Perhaps while uh, we have uh, Jeremy live, I maybe can pose a question to all of you. Do you have any other uh, questions that you'd like to go to go ahead and pose to Jeremy at this time? <clears throat> Michael, um, one question that I already posted in the in the chat box was uh, um, the specifications for open source hardware. Uh, will they also, at least at the nice to have level, will they also point at uh, certain requirements that make sense, like cradle to cradle, uh, so uh, no waste or, yeah. or minimize waste in production in use. And uh, and in the end of the life life cycle, the, the 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 possibility to upgrade the product to something else, something like that. Mm. Uh, I, I guess yeah. I guess there are two questions in your question. There is the 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 the, the question whether um, opens well whether the standards um, considers as documentation is documentation for making or or just for making the product. Or, but, or is it also uh, for also repairing it and processing it at the end of life? So the, the answer is yes. Um, this, um, this standard adopts a, pro adopts a product lifecycle perspective, and this is also an innovation compared to the open source hardware uh, definition from the Open Source Hardware Association. Um, we defined, um, so there, there are four, four fundamental fundamental rights of, uh, of open source hardware and the one the first one is the right to make and we, we said actually making is not about really manufacturing the product it's all, it's also about uh, the whole life all activities in the life cycle it's also about um, end of life processing repairing remanufacturing uh, maintaining uh, using and so on right so we adopt an open um, um, a full life cycle approach, which is something which is new and which is nice. Then the second part of the question is whether um, the, uh, the standard states specific requirements for the project itself and not for its documentation. And the reference is that says no. Um, this standard is about documentation and only about documentation. It's not about design. It's not about product design itself. Um, and I think this is some kind of loophole in the open source hardware community for now that we talk a lot about licenses and documentation. I mean, in the last 10 years, we talked a lot about licenses and this has been coined by the Open Source Hardware Association 
definition and they, they solve that problem of loss licensing in, in some way. Well, they, they stayed in stand and stand up for it, which is pretty much um, acknowledged in the field. And we, in this, uh, in this DIN Spec 3105, in this new working group, we address one level more, which is the content of the documentation. But still, uh, and you're totally right with that, uh, there is one other level, which is still not addressed at all, which is what kind of product is that? And what does the product does? And, and um, is it a good product? <laughs> and what, 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 mean op what means openness in structural um, uh, terms for the product itself? So is it a product open architecture? Is it modular? Can you change parts and can you, can you replace them? Um, and that's a, totally the whole new field, which will be really interesting to looking at, but uh, was way beyond uh, the scope of, of our project. Well, uh, it's, it, it has a lot to do with the, uh, uh, with the potential of open source hardware to reproduce. I mean, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm so much taken by uh, the last video that Marcin Jakubowski recently uh, published, and he's talking mm -hmm. about the incredible, this, uh, how should I say, contradiction between the, 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 the fact that we have a lot of uh, interesting products and interesting standards, but we don't have an ecosystem of companies, enterprises that take them up, that, uh, that start to work with it. And there seems to be something missing. There seems to be a lot of rules of the game that still have to be defined because nobody really knows what they're really investing <laughs> yeah. when, they, when they turn open source hardware. And I guess this, this topic of um, ecosystem of companies about, around open source hardware um, is one of the motivations why we in, invested in this project because I think at, so at the same time, we are working on a, on a project which is called OpenX, the EU-funded funded, uh, uh, project that started last year. And um, um, I think we have a bit of background noise from Paolo Caro. I think. Um, sorry, I, I lost what I was... Uh, yeah. And so at the same time, we have a, a project which is called Open Next. Uh, I, I'm just gonna type the, um, the name in the chat, the next.eu, you can just uh, put that in, uh, uh, visit this URL to see the project. And basically it's about how can we make the link between open source hardware communities and, and companies? So how can we make that um, at some point in time, there will be, uh, Linux of hardware that will be emerging. You know, you know, Linux is a is a is a project that belong to nobody in open source software. Um, there are a lot of people working on it, and there is an ecosystem of companies working on uh, on on Linux. But there's not not really such a thing in open source hardware. So, see Jeremy, could you could you uh, type the link again because I didn't see it in the chat. Uh, oh, sorry. I just uh, send it to one person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jeremy, uh, I would like to add something. Uh, well, uh, Leopold, there was somebody who's had his hand up for maybe about 10 minutes. Can, can, I, can we go ahead and give Jerome an opportunity to pose a question? I promise I won't forget you, Leopold. But he was very good. Go ahead and raise his hand. <laughs> Jerome, please feel free. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I understand. In fact, I, there's a kind of forum uh, for the FabX Live and I raised that question there also. Um, I think that we also need uh, a kind of way to certify products. Um, uh, let's say uh, I make an open source washing machine and I want to sell it. I will need to pay uh, CSA, ULC, ULCE um, fees mm -hmm. for the, um, the security certification. And those fees are very expensive. And even if another company built the same precise machine, I didn't fork anything, I made it entirely similar, I will, have, I will still have to pay those, those fees. That's, um, I think, a huge trouble for um, the open hardware movement. Uh, for example, I wanted to, to build a um, precious plastic machine for my fab lab. But since we are located in a, a public school, um, I will have huge troubles with the insurance uh, since they will mm -hmm. say, oh, that machine is in CSA or something like that. And 
yet I, I never found uh, anybody trying to address that question. I would like to ask Jeremy what he thinks about it. That's it. Um, Thanks, Sean. Well, I can say straight away, I don't have any answer for your problem. Uh, I, I share your concerns and I think this is a great problem. But I understand that this is a problem that um, you cannot grant, you cannot really give a, like a, a nationally valid certificate to a community. You, you need to, to give it to a, a, a registered organization, right? So you see Mark, you will get it uh, um, and it will be associated with your with your company, so with your registered organization. And I guess that's a problem that um, any of those uh, really important labels, uh, security labels or whatever, uh, they will all they will be always uh, linked to an organization itself, uh, as far as I understand it. And so on. That's 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 a problem. Um, it in fact, I, I'm thinking maybe about uh, a kind of security certifi certification that can be given to the design and then uh, having a kind of bypass for the, the manufacturers, maybe just to pass an audit instead of having to pay for the entire process. Mm. So let's say the I design guess... itself is approved and then they have to be audited for the, the manufacturing. Mm. Could be a kind of... Uh, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I would suspect that um, like the cost of having a C mark is more in the paperwork, in doing the paperwork, in, in submitting the paperwork than in paying for it. So I, I guess that if your open source hardware project is um, uh, advanced enough so that you can document all the necessary paperwork so that your product gets a CE and you share this documentation, then somebody will be able to take it one-to-one -one and to submit it and get a C mark. Um, I don't know a lot of, about CE, but I worked a lot with the uh, ULC. Um, in fact, they said that they are a nonprofit organization, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, but the, uh, there's a paperwork, but there's a lot of um, arbitrary uh, working. They, they need somebody to check at your, uh, to audit you, in fact. Mm. Um, uh, I don't have a solution. I was just trying to raise the point just to see um, how it will, uh, how, how you will react. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, that, that's, um, that's a really good thing. And I'm, I mean, if that was the only problem for now, it would mean that open source hardware is way much advanced than I think it is for the moment. Um, I, think, I, th I think open source hardware now still struggles with more basic issues um, um, for what I, I personally, and this is only my personal opinion here. Um, I think most of open source hardware projects um, are more about technology development than really about product development. It means that uh, a guy or group of people they will work on, um, they have an idea of to, uh, I don't know, to, to make a microscope um, uh, with, a, with, a, um, uh, with a smartphone, right? So they develop a piece of hardware to turn your, uh, your, um, um, your phone into a microscope and then they validate the technology, they make, make a few prototypes and then they stop here and eventually they will commercialize, commercialize a derivative of it. But what will be the open source hardware will be the technology development or the basic technology to make it, but not the final product itself. And I think a, a, a tiny share of all open source hardware projects finally end up in commercializing product. Um, and I'm not really sure why, but um, I suspect that people in open source hardware are more interested or people are more interested in sharing uh, a hard, uh, uh, um, sharing documentation about technology development more than about precise products. Because precise products are, are, are more or less boring. What, what is interesting is, is develop new things, but like 99% of all products are just remixes of things that already exist, right? But um, well, this is more or less my, my personal, take on it. Uh, and I think 
this is one of the reasons why this the, the, the problem you are uh, putting on the table, which is really relevant uh, and maybe really hard to overcome, um, maybe comes a bit later in the, in, in the processing chain. If, if, if I can there, say there's like that. A, I will say that the, uh, currently it is possible to have a fab lab entirely built uh, within another fab lab with open mm -hmm. sources machine um, there is a kind of uh, bid to see who is going to be the first fab lab to do that and i think that those are going to be put okay. on the map um, but they will have to overcome that issue or maybe i think people sign some kind of uh, discharge i don't know mm -hmm. okay yeah no that's um I haven't seen this issue of yeah replic replicating machines in uh, um, in environment uh, where you need yeah need to show that it's secure so yeah and, and it, yeah it makes sense um, I, I don't have anything more to react on that but I, I I'll take that and reflect on it <laughs> thanks for that Leopold I haven't forgotten you I thanks for your patience if you want to go ahead and raise your question no problem. Uh, I just wanted to add a comment to Jeremy's statement that we need a Linux of hardware. And uh, I think it's already there. Uh, it's, it's called Arduino. And uh, that's, that, that's the point uh, also with, with, with the products. I mean, there are a lot of real products, but all, almost all of this open source hardware products are electronic products. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, yeah, sorry. There's one thing that I, I haven't said and I should have said at the beginning. Um, well, actually I said it. I'm, I'm from the mechanical, I'm from the department of mechanical engineering. So yeah. I'm talking about hardware, I'm talking about machines. I'm talking about a car, I'm talking about a plane, I'm talking about a, yeah. uh, a CNC machine. And um, yes, we have some kind of Linux of electronic hardware, but we don't have a Linux of mechanical hardware. Um, yeah. And, and I, I'd be curious to know what, what, it, what it will become. And I, and I guess it will be more some kind of plug and play technology like, um, like, um, like a car platform that could be reused and reused or like a, a parametric car platform, those kind of things that could be shared by a lot of people, a lot of companies. Um, yeah. Do we have any other questions for Jeremy? Okay, it looks Jeremy that we'll be able to relieve you here. Uh, so that's good news. I'd like to just make one last comment from my side, apart from thanking you once again for attending, it's always easy to say what's missing. It's always easy. Uh, we have difficulty in celebrating what we've done. And we don't realize that we only by doing something do we see what's missing. So for me, what you did was a milestone. And I think that needs to be applauded. So thank you very much That's for that. Cool. Jeremy. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, no, I think it's important to say that because it's always easy to focus on those things that we need to have completed, but we, and without us really defining what's there and what's not there, which is basically what you've done, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. So my personal take is because you did what you did, we were able to have this conversation today. And I think that's worth applauding. Uh, okay, Ma Mike, maybe we should open the-, the Yes, I'd like to. And that was the intention, Leopold. Are there any other questions on any of the other subjects that you'd like uh, to go ahead and cover? We have about 15 minutes still, I believe. Um, no, we have uh, about uh, 45. Well, we have 45 minutes. Okay, well, that's a little bit better then. I, uh, I know that there was some uh, comments uh, tied to uh, vertical uh, farming uh, that came uh, through. Uh, sure. I, I make my very last screen sharing. And uh, okay. as you might know, 42 is the answer to every question. Uh, but the, the, the question is what uh, was the question. <laughs> so uh, I collected some questions uh, I have, I would like to discuss, but uh, I'm totally open. If uh, you have uh, uh, other more burning questions, we can also discuss other questions. 
we've had a few hands that have been raised since uh, we made the call to action. There were two Thomases that raised their hands. Uh, unfortunately, both hands have been uh, brought down. So I would say the two Thomases, you can, uh, oh, say Thomas Poulon, would you like to go ahead and start the conversation, please? Yes, sure. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Per perfect. So my question is more about the uh, kind of equipment needed for the Fab Lab build around the, the micro village uh, build around the Fab Lab and permaculture. Is the standard uh, equipment of the Fab Lab uh, enough to build all the all we need to sustain this kind of project, or we need some uh, more or specialized uh, type of equipment? Uh, Leopold, would you be able to answer that? Perhaps somebody else from the audience? Uh, may, maybe France is the, the right to answer the, the micro-village question. Uh, but what, what I can answer is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about uh, how I can connect to the so-called uh, Wood White Web. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for that, of course, we need a lot of, of uh, sensors and electronics and monitoring. Uh, I, I can, can think that uh, machine learning uh, can, can help uh, uh, to, to these questions. But uh, I assume that there are no standards now. That's uh, really really new stuff uh, we have to solve. Okay. Um, concerning the micro villages that Caitlin asked about, <laughs> um, actually Leopold put me on the trace of uh, Joy Lohmann who, who, started, uh, who started a project called Open Island. And that's a really fantastic project. It's about uh, it's about floating habitat. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put this in the chat. It's a, it's a fantastic link. Um, and it's, uh, it's this kind of uh, meta hardware development, if you wish, yeah? uh, development of uh, meaningful uh, uh, composed structures that allow uh, for the for the for the technologies that that we are really aiming at uh, to 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 become embedded yeah so so um, for example uh, the the open island project uh, is a project uh, uh, using uh, recycled material to create floating habitat yeah? and, and 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 Caitlin was asking well uh, uh, couldn't we combine that with the idea of of doing uh, uh, um, maritime farming, uh, there are fantastic uh, there are fantastic uh, structures uh, for creating so so called vertical reefs, uh, where you can really uh, recreate a, a whole bunch of uh, of uh, conditions that uh, that make fish and plants uh, uh, thrive again. You know, and uh, and then. Uh, can you put them uh, around uh, uh, around uh, uh, agglomeration cities and uh, and uh, and so on? So this is this is really the line of thought that I would like to pursue. Um, um, Leopold and, and 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 I we we discussed vaguely about creating an event uh, next year about uh, about this uh, this uh, structures, architectural structures, spatial structures. That that can uh, that can uh, host that can facilitate uh, this uh, this this uh, circular technologies and of course circular technologies they have a different kind of uh, logic you know you don't even have to be worried about their uh, their, their uh, recognition as as a, as a as a commercial product because the main thing is they they are set in motion in the environment that you create to feed yourself and others you know and it's 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 not a it's not so much a commercial logic driving them and if you if you really if you really want uh, this kind of 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 hardware to exist in masses why not team up with a with a large company that that can produce uh, things in masses but let the 
let the uh, people who are uh, who are having a meaningful vision take the technology development in their hands. So this is a new kind of alliance, maybe also between communities and businesses. Why do we have to? Why do we have to care about all these uh, uh, complex requirements that uh, Jeremy was just talking about? Okay, too many thoughts, I know. And we also had a note in the chat that uh, once you, you and Leopold have put that together, that somebody would like you to go ahead and bring that to So you want to keep it part of your planning, okay? Just wanted Great. to make sure you're aware of that. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, let's, that's assuming that we can all do some traveling by that point in time. There were some comments that came through in the chat. Let me see well, if I can um, go ahead. Uh, may I, may, Sorry, Michael, Michael, may I say yes. one thing? Yes. Uh, the Global Village 21 um, is supposed to be a distributed event, you know. So we want the same thing, the same thought to happen at various locations of the globe with some specialization. For example, one location could take up that challenge of the open islands and of the micro villages around uh, maritime cities. Yeah. So if we have if we have imagined that we have a worldwide community thinking about our habitat in the 21st century, it's such a vast uh, array of possibilities that it would be good actually to have communities spread all over the world to deal with special questions and exchange their results. So that's the, that's the kind of design we have in mind. Okay. Well, uh, Thomas has already volunteered to support you in the in that event in Montreal, and so with that, we've already started the ball rolling. I would say uh, right. there was a question tied to the presentation. Uh, this was addressed to you, Leopold. I, th I believe I can just go ahead and answer it. It's part of the uh, Miro board. There's a link that uh, we will make sure that if you have not received, it should already be in the chat, isn't it, Leopold? The the link to the Miro board. Yes, it's in the uh, beginning. Again, the, the beginning the, of the chat. The, the it's in the link beginning of the chat. The mirror board is in the chat and also the link to the crypto pad. And uh, uh, it will remain online for some time also after this session. And uh, if, if you put uh, your email contact uh, into the chat, uh, I also can send you uh, a, a presentation afterward. Well, I think Leopold just made you an offer you can't refuse. Thank you very much for that one, Leopold. Do we have any other questions from the audience tied to any of the subjects that have been discussed so far, or perhaps um, some of the other elements discussed in the various presentations? Uh, we have a few. We have one from Raquel. I'm, I'm sorry, this is going too quick. Let's go back. Um, apologies. I need to go ahead and get into the chat. I posted the link. I posted the link to the mirror port again. Uh, Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and the comment from Raquel, I cannot find. Oh, yeah. I'm interested in discussing what it will take to make the nexus between land and nature and community. And I think this sounds like something again for both of you guys. Um, as you've presented it, I think there is a need for cultural change is your project a concrete example? And I would say e either one of you or perhaps both would like to go ahead and answer that one because I think it applies to both of that of what you talked about. Yeah, uh, let me start. <laughs> okay, fire away. Mm -hmm. um, on behalf of Leopold, I took, uh, <laughs> I, I took no, no, wait, wait. wait. I took a, a, a journey uh, to one of the most interesting places when it comes to community and nature. Actually, that's Tamera in Portugal. And that's a community that had made several fantastic technological advances. Number one, they created with the help of permaculturalist uh, Sepp Holzer, a water retention landscape. And that's the most spectacular thing that Portugal ever experienced. You know, Alentejo is in summer, it's a brown desert. And in that brown desert suddenly emerged a green island, just uh, 
by the by the uh, technology of permaculture, which which uh, which is an art of keeping water uh, or local instead of letting it go away and flow away. So that that was water retention landscape. Number two, there were fantastic uh, housing schemes based on clay. Uh, so that was a, that was a cons an architect from Kassel. Uh, who did this wonderful houses. And number three, uh, the solar power village. Uh, also by itself, a technological breakthrough uh, by Jürgen Kleinwächter. And uh, uh, this is a, a family that has been in the business of, of creating technology for more than a, uh, half a century. And I was going there and said, you have fantastic things here. For example, I saw that they're working on a Scheffler mirror, uh, uh, you know, this uh, parabolic uh, structures, and they, are, they were working with a university to fine tune that, so they could really start to melt scrap metal just by solar power. And this is Tanera, you know, uh, it is a community of 150 people that has this uh, wonderful power. They said, why the hell? aren't you making a dedicated open source fab lab or open eco lab or whatever, you know? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's so hard. <laughs> we, and, 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 and the problem is that, uh, that we have this, we have still this separation between the people that doing, uh, that they, they are creating a viable, uh, strong community and the people that are networking. And, and I think we are just at the brink. When these two forces join, uh, then we really will achieve something. When the fab labs are not just uh, in, the, in, 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 in some places in the urban sphere, but when they move out to the country and they are embedded in a real life process of a community. And, uh, and we here in Australia, we're working very hard we have uh, two or three places with uh, rural communities. Uh, for example, one that meant, went to a military compound, uh, they bought an, an old caserne uh, and uh, they, 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 they fundraised two and a half million euro. And now they have in 14 hectares and they have all these workshop buildings. Huh? And still they have little companies uh, producing commercial products. Uh, and it is, it is, it is, for them, it's a question of survival, and uh, and 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 uh, to to establish a fab lab is almost still a hobbyist luxury, and Leopold is probably the only person that spent his money entirely on creating a place in the countryside with an open source logo on it. <laughs> Okay, Mike, I, I totally agree. We need a culture change. And uh, I think we also need a change in, in our mindset. And uh, I, I'm really wondering if I look on under this conference, there is one big track. It's uh, called Reboot Economy. And I think that's totally wrong. It's not about rebooting our... Uh, <laughs> Terrible economy, it's about restructuring our economy and other things. Thanks for everybody leaving their email addresses. It's, it's, it's really a gift for us that we can stay in touch with you. Here, Leopold, I'm going to break from the tradition of being a moderator to allude to some things that you just said regarding the economy. The, the real issue is that we have a model where growth is, is defined by producing things that nobody wants. And so if we, well, the one thing that we very rarely talk about in such conversations is the, the elephant in the room, that being the power and money. And so we need to address this question of beyond GDP. <laughs> and I think that alludes directly, uh, Franz, to what you're talking about, why this stays 
in, in the small uh, confines and why we do not have critical mass because we have a number of people that are not interested in this gaining traction. And I'm, I'm just being very direct. And I think it's important for us to address that and figure out ways to overcome it. I think the example that you gave where people were able to put, uh, what was it, two and a half million or two million uh, to go ahead by 14 acres and start doing what they believe is correct. It all comes down to empowerment when people feel empowered and they do a lot of things. So the real issue here is how do we get people to feel empowered so that this just, just happens? <laughs> Sorry, I get off my um, off my soapbox, and I will go ahead and turn it back over to everybody else. Is there any other questions or comments that anybody would like to go ahead and pose here? Or did I scare you away here? <laughs> Anything else? What what what's with all the the others? What what are your most burning questions. Uh, Thomas came think? back with his hand up. So maybe we give the stage back to Thomas, please. Uh, maybe quickly to make a link with what was talked about this morning about policy and the importance of once you reach a certain critical level in the niche, maybe you need some kind of fr framework a little bit higher to make sure it, it become a little bit more mainstream. Which kind of policy at some point do you see being needed to make the jump to a more mainstream type of evolution for this kind of project. Uh, Leopold, Franz? I didn't get the point, sorry. Can you repeat again? Yeah, but th this morning, um, I think it was Juliet talking about the importance of having some kind of policy framework past some point in order for a, a project or a vision or, or a type of development to become more mainstream and more widely adopted. So what kind of policy at some point do you need, do you see uh, that will be needed for this kind of my uh, project? Okay, um, maybe two examples. Um, one uh, is the, the French example that I quoted, uh, so that uh, there is, uh, there is now a, a considerable, um, uh, there is a discussion uh, uh, and there is, there is an idea uh, floating around to, to establish this uh, microfab labs as a, as, a, as, a, as a structure all around the country and have them by design cooperate with each other and integrate them into the vocational education system. So it becomes like a, like a, a work supported by the French nation. This is, this is one policy framework I like very much. Another framework that I like even more um, is uh, the Spanish case. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the work uh, and the name of Manuel Castells. Manuel Castells is a, is a, a famous sociologist uh, who wrote uh, books about uh, the uh, development of uh, this globally controlling cities uh, very much along uh, with Saskia Sassen and others in the 90s. They described this uh, uh, tendency of the global networking to, to reinforce urban centers. Now Manuel Castells has become the Ministry of Education in Spain and he has surprised the whole world with a very radical and, uh, and very <laughs> unusual idea. He said, I want to mo move all the students uh, that it makes sense to move to the countryside. So we want to we wanna bring this uh, uh, potential, this creative potential of young people to the areas suffering from brain drain. No, this is for me, this is, this is one of the most impressive statements that was given recently by anybody in Europe. And uh, I don't know uh, how much substance is behind that, but I would really gladly support this as an idea that we would uh, also uh, require in other countries. Thank you.
it, it should be noted that Spain has also decided to deploy UBI. So I think there's something to be said about the initiatives coming out of Spain today. That would give a lot of time and space, economic space for people to do projects like that. Indeed. Precisely. Great. Any other questions or comments or complaints even? We'll take complaints. This time we'll take complaints. Okay. Then maybe, um, Franz, Leopold, anything else you'd like to go ahead and, and cover more in detail? I think everybody's a little bit tired. <laughs> and it <laughs> seems that way. We received a whole batch of email addresses. And for me, I tend to think that this is the last round at the bar. And so, um, perhaps maybe some closing words from both you two gentlemen, and then we can yeah, ask, make one more call of questions and call it a day. I, I would like to, to get some, some comments on uh, how, what, what do you think, uh, what, what could be or should be the next steps uh, uh, in, in Fab Labs? Where, where should they go? I think Francis' observation was correct. I think we, we, we've had a number of people deposit their email addresses. And there was a request um, for perhaps a repeat performance, Leopold and Franz, um, because they enjoyed it so much. And I think they'd like to go ahead and make sure their friends are back time. I don't know, if, have either of you thought about it? Sorry, oops, Jeffrey has his hand up. Please, Jeffrey, the stage is yours. Uh Oh, okay. I'm, uh, I, hi, I'm, hi, I'm, I'm uh, here from Malawi um, in uh, South Central Africa, and, and um, I've been uh, focused on starting a fab lab here um, for, I don't know, probably more than a few years, but uh, I, I only discovered uh, this ecosystem back in November when I went to, when I was in Boston and I went to the uh, Fab Foundation. And um, you know, I've I've only been listening to this whole discussion sort of out of one ear, and um, because I'm, I, I, but I, I was you know very interested to come to this because because of that. I mean, Malawi, um, as as a lot of the developing world is 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 very um, uh, you know in need of of fab labs because you know the resources are low. I mean, despite the fact that you know around every corner there's a there's a low resource fab, you know, fab lab. There are many, many actually skilled wood, you know, woodworkers and metal workers, but they're working with, with basic, basic tools. And, and a, a fab lab um, could revolutionize. I mean, they have skill. A lot, there's a lot of skill. There's a lot of creativity. But, but what's missing is, is, is the resources. So when you ask the question about, well, where should we build fab labs? And the answer really is, is you know, uh, in, in areas that, that, that are desperate for, um, you know, for tools um, be, beyond hand tools that could um, really benefit from this. So, you know, I, it's why I'm, you know, when I, when I came to Malawi four and a half years ago and realized, wow, lots of creativity, but almost no resource and no government support, at least at that time. And so I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, excited to have, you know, to be part of this, um, um, uh, this uh, a pro this uh, uh, conference uh, because it's great to learn of others who are who are working on these issues. Um, you know, I, I also wanted to address. I had made a comment about. You know, there was a, a little bit uh, a side discussion about you know UL you know uh, uh, the the uh, um, um, oh, excuse me I'm I'm a little bit lost lost for words the or, you know or, organizations like like UL and CE. I've, I've, I've put products through, through both of those. Um, um, and uh, a very frustrating process. And, and I, I really do think, I mean, these organizations are all about trust, right? So, so if, if this community can, can um, uh, 
get get our message out uh, that you know this the, the level uh, you know the level of um, sophistication of, of open source ideas etc um, are just as valid as um, you know and, and having the community validate designs validate actual you know uh, uh, products that come out of fab labs I, I think it's it's important because you know we, we all tend to say oh you, you know oh it's certified by CE or UL um, and this is you know this is about safety and I, I know personally that at least in the case of, of, of UL um, it's not about safety it's about money um, so so I think we I think we, we need to be you know uh, maybe focused less on 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 those cert agencies than getting a public awareness that this this move this is it's more than a movement um, and and what comes out of it is is just as valid um, as as you know the, the you know the quote unquote commercial space so I, that, that's all I had to say I, I'm I'm a, I'm a, a forty a four decade um, maker but mostly a solo maker um, and my my I'm an electrical engineer and and a software developer and and um, I, you know so I, it's uh, you know, this is this this is all very very exciting. I'm although although I am surprised that the that the attendance is is low. I, I would I would would have expected to be much you know there to be much more uh, um, a, a greater attendance at this at this organization. But but maybe it it really is still in its infancy. So so thank you guys for for this uh, for this uh, uh, session. It, it was it was quite quite good. Uh, I have I a break. Great, great, uh, great comments. And, um, 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 Jeffrey, the, there was a very interesting uh, lecture yesterday from Senam Kofi from Africa, mm. and uh, I, I put a, I put a link into the chat. Uh, he is from uh, Plurality University, and uh, what, what what I wanted to mention is that uh, we in Europe are thinking about Frugal innovation, and if we look to Africa, they are practicing <laughs> frugal innovation. Yeah. yeah. And oh yes. I think we could learn a lot from what they are doing in Africa. Useful things, mm. not 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 designed just for for money. Yes. Yes. Again, thank you very much for your comments, Jeffrey. I can also say that your comments tied to UL uh, are not only are they correct, but we have our own here in Europe. It's called TUF. <laughs> we do the yeah. same thing here in Europe. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And they fight against each other. Of course. Yeah, it gets this power and money, of course. Great. Uh, any other questions or comments? Maybe some comments to that of what uh, was just said? I would like to uh, just take up the suggestion to create a, a group or a workshop in the framework of uh, Fabix Life. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we, are, we are not able to, to, to run that presentation again within the, within the existing uh, uh, conference right now, uh, within the ongoing conference. But uh, I think uh, if we can do it with a little bit of uh, distance in time, we will gladly do it. Uh, I think I also speaking for Leopold. Huh? And this is uh, Rebecca with Fabex Live. Sorry, I'm just I'm just jumping room to room to help the rooms. But um, if you are interested, if you are interested, um, you can just email us. We can help you set up the group if you want. It's super easy, um, but you just have to enter to the platform. And um, we can add you as a moderator, so you can create a group and add people to join, and you can continue the discussion in there with um, text, photos, whatever, you know, to just have the dialogue. So just send us an email or, you know, we can help you make that happen. Okay. Excellent. Thing. Thanks for jumping in. And we will have, um, like, workshops and working groups throughout next week and the following weeks. We're trying to like you guys are saying, really keep the movement going. So, mm. um, you know, if anyone wants to hold something else or a working group or really, you know, like the academy working group and the assistive technologies working group, if there's one that you want to continue 
you know, we're hoping to engage people in the platform That's hard. I over the coming weeks and months. Um, so this, works, right? this is how, really exciting. How Good. Great. Thank you very much for that feedback. Okay, um, we have, we're reaching the end of our allotted time, then perhaps maybe some final words from uh, our, the Masters of Ceremony, that being Franz and Leopold. Um, any comments you'd like to go ahead and share with the group before we make a close today? Well, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, I could take part in this and, uh, and I'm very happy about the positive response. Uh, couldn't really fathom if that uh, if that uh, would happen before, and it was uh, it was encouraging. Thank you very much. And Leopold, we leave you with the last thoughts of this session. Okay, so uh, I just uh, also want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, the, the the two links uh, will remain online for some time. And uh, I try to pick out uh, all the email contacts you you put into the chat. And uh, yeah, I, I hope we can stay in contact because I think uh, it's it's very important to improve our our, our networking and and cooperations. Okay, and perhaps I will go ahead and close and also pay asking my thanks uh, for the for all that was put together to, today, your input was invaluable for us to make this a, a very interesting, innovative, and exciting two hours. And that's a thing we can make quite often that we're two hours and it stayed interesting for two hours. So uh, thank you all for attending and um, no doubt we will all be in touch. And stay safe. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good move. <laughs> yeah. I've it's better good. late than never. <laughs> sorry? I figured, oh, sorry. <laughs> Keep on. <laughs> what, what do you want to say? I don't know, because <laughs> I just turned on, on the camera and uh, Franz had said, thank you for showing up. And I <laughs> didn't know if he was saying directly to me, because I'd only just turned the camera on now after the whole, <laughs> the whole thing. Okay. But, <laughs> but thank nice you anyway. all. This was very, very interesting. Thank you. That is really thank you. big encouragement from, from all of you. And, uh, and um, yeah, especially also that so many women are taking place in this development because <laughs> they will be the leading force, you know. <laughs> we're, just, we're just handing over and, and uh, giving some ideas. Uh, but I think it's, it belongs uh, to the hand of those who really can manage these things. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. We're happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your effort.